Good evening, everyone. How you doing? Everybody hear me okay? I'm not too muffled or staticky then? <laughs> I just want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Joseph Kent. I'm the Director of Education here at the National Atomic Testing Museum. On behalf of the, our board and our staff here, I just want to say thank you so much for coming out to listen to TD's talk. Um, you know, it's just wonderful to see such a great turnout. Uh, TD's a, um, a fun guy, he always gives a great lecture, so we're just excited to see a great turnout. And um, I'm just going to introduce TD here in a second. Um, I did want to mention a few things. One, if you're interested in buying any of, any of his books, they are all signed and they're $27 each. Um, they are available in the store now, but I don't believe they're going to be available after the talk. So if anybody's interested, um, they are available now. They're also going to be here tomorrow as well, any remaining ones. So just wanted to give you a heads up on that. And then the other thing is, the next talk that we're going to have is on October 25th, um, which is a Friday. And it's about the USS Nevada, which was present during um, the, um, Pearl Harbor, as well as adding support at Iwo Jima and Okinawa. It was also present at two nuclear tests in the um, Pacific. So he's going to be talking about, Dr. Younger's going to be talking about that interesting piece of history. So that's going to be October 25th um, next month. So I just want to let you know. And then I'm going to introduce TD. It's going to be a brief introduction. So TD Barnes is an author and entrepreneur. He grew up on a ranch in Dalhart, Texas. And he also served as an Army Intelligence Specialist in Korea. Um, he then continued his education while in the US Army. He attended two and a half years of missile and radar electronics by day, and then took classes at night. His career includes uh, being a field engineer at the NASA um, high range in Nevada for the X-15, the XB-70, lifting, lunar, uh, lifting bodies and lunar landing vehicles. He uh, also worked on the NERVA project at Jackass Flats in Nevada. And he was also uh, part of special projects at Area 51. Uh, he later formed a family oil and gas exploration company where they drilled, produced oil and gas, and mined oil, or I'm sorry, mined uh, uranium and gold. He currently serves as the CEO of Startel Inc. and is actively mining landscape and rock and gold in Nevada. Now, he is also the president of the Roadrunners International, an association of Area 51 veterans, and uh, executive director of the Nevada Aerospace Hall of Fame. Now, you may have seen him in uh, different documentaries, including um, um, Area 51 Desclass Declassified and CIA Secrets of Area 51. He was also um, featured on History Channel, Discovery Channel, Travel Channel, and others. And he is also featured in the book uh, by Annie Jacobson called Area 51 Declassified, which documents his career. So needless to say, TD is a wealth of information, and he, all, like I said, always gives a wonderful presentation. And so, without further ado, I give you TD Barnes. Thank you. Very well. oh, be good. good evening. Thank you for um, the introduction. Thank you all of you for attending tonight. I think we're going to have some fun. Uh, I see a few people that have been here before and heard some of my talks before. Uh, tonight you will hear some new stuff. They, uh, they are declassifying what we did at Area 51 just left and right. And it's even, even some of the stuff that uh, I'm receiving almost on a daily basis is, um, uh, is very interesting to say the least. I'm going to talk about before we start this, why I'm able to talk about Area 51 when the Air Force can't, the Department of Energy can't. About four or five months ago, I did a panel discussion at the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency in Washington. I had Tony Bravacra, who was a U-2 pilot that trained at Area 51, and uh, SR-71 pilot, and then I had uh, Gary Powers Jr. And we just freely, we talked to the workforce there, and we just freely talked about Area 51 and the stuff we did. That's where they said, you know what, we can't say Area 51 in this building. And this, I mean, this is four or five months ago. And, you know, everybody knows about Area 51. I mean, you know, there's a storm in the place. But there's a good, <laughs> but there's a good, there's a good reason why we can talk about it and the others can't. The CIA uh, got out of the business at Area 51 in 19, uh, 
69, 79. And I'll talk about this a little bit in the my presentation. And they started to classify and things and um, they classified their planes in 1991. And then they, um, uh, as I'll cover in here, they brought us back to Langley in 2009. That's when I had to tell my wife where I worked and what I did all those years. And as they started to classify and everything, they realized that they, when we boxed up everything and turned it over to the Air Force in, in 79, we stored all of our records at Norton Air Force Base. When they got ready to start declassifying what we did out there, there's no records. So the chief historian at CIA called me up and as, uh, it was mentioned I'm the head of the Roadrunners International, which is all of the um, CIA, Air Force, contractor, all the people that worked out there, Area 51, during the, the, the period the CIA was there. And being the president of that, I know, I know all, the, all the pilots, all the engineers, everybody that worked out there. So what we did as the CIA encouraged me to start a website and start having their people write out their bios of what they did. And they, they started collecting information from the pilots, the engineers, this and that. And they'd have a document back at CIA headquarters. They wouldn't know what it meant. They'd fax it to me. I'd put it on the website just to draw a comment. What is this? And I'd bring out the whole story. And they, we slowly started rebuilding the, the history and the legacy of what we did. Because back during the day, we did not talk about Area 51. And we never used the name. We might call it the ranch or the out yonder or something like that, but we didn't talk about it. And the reason people, other agencies can't talk about it is if they ever admit there is an Area 51, and would apply to CIA too back in the day with this year operator, I'll guarantee you that the attorneys would be lined up completely from here to Area 51, just trying to shut down this, shut down that. You'd have environmental groups shut them down for some reason or other. You'd have uh, the Soviet Union, you'd have the Chinese, or not Soviet Union, Russia, the um, Chinese, through proxies, they'd hire, get some agency or unit, uh, outfit here in the States to do it, to head it up for them. They would do everything they could to shut down whatever is going on at Area 51. So by not admitting that it even exists, you can't sue something that doesn't exist. So that's the reason they will never admit, even though it's, everybody knows it's there, uh, they can't officially say, yeah, we, we're out there. They're calling it an operating facility, not no specific place. And there's operating facilities all over the desert out there, particularly today. And, uh, but that's how we avoided getting sued during the day. And it also was how we avoided being anyone knowing what we've done. And the, um, so that's one of the reasons we can talk about it. And actually, we've done the Air Force and the other agencies a favor because we tell what really it goes on out there, no secrets of what goes on, but general idea, it's a place where we fly planes. We test planes. We don't build anything there. We test there. It's a laboratory. It's where we say, show us what you got. Boeing, you got a new plane you want to sell the Air Force? Bring it out here and show the Air Force what you got. Show the Navy what you got. And that's a show and tell. And that's one of the reasons for so much secrecy. Maybe you got Lockheed and Boeing competing with each other on a new plane they're wanting to sell, say, the Navy. Well, they, they bring it to Area 51. That's where they can test it to see if everything they claim it will do, we'll, we'll do that. And they'll bring the Navy out. Well, Lockheed not, naturally would not want a Boeing knowing what they got. So no one talks about it. It's the same way when they bring their stuff out there. So the people out there are bound to secrecy. They do not talk shop. And that way the, the, uh, the corporations are feel safe about bringing their secrets out there to test them. That's what Area 51 looked like in 1917. <laughs> the reason we needed an Area 51, I like to tell this, is we had just came out of the Korean War fighting the Russians, a proxy war. Like many other wars we've had, the Russians are in the background furnishing planes, they're doing the training, they might put a North Korean in the plane, but they're the ones that put him in there. They had built the Iron Curtain. We didn't know what they were doing behind the Iron Curtain. They closed off the, the country. They claimed they had the best bombers in the world. They had more than we had. They claimed they had more missiles than we had. Well, guess what? They put the first satellite in the orbit, the Sputnik, 
One morning we woke up, here's a satellite in orbit. We hadn't done that yet. They put the first man into space. They, by all indications, they were ahead of us. They were spreading communism, that crazy, that's our biggest fear. We just gotten out of wars because of communism. We, we were afraid that they were going to bomb the United States. We were next. We needed to know what's going on there. We had lost 200 crewmen in Russia flying uh, modified bombers in their, we called it ferret flights. They'd fly in and try to get some photographs. But that's before we ever lost Gary Powers or anyone else. We'd already lost 200 people. We realized we needed to build a plane that could fly in there and not be shot down. We approached the um, committees for uh, President Eisenhower. Well, they first approached um, the Air Force. Well, General LeMay, he was pretty set in his ways, to put it mildly. He said, there's no way I'll build a plane that does shoot guns or, or drop bombs. And I'm sure as hell not going to build a plane that got one engine. And that's what it takes to get to the altitude we needed to go, the U-2. And so he just flat, he walked out of the meetings. He said, I'm not, even, not the least bit interested. And Eisenhower got to thinking, he said, well, I wouldn't want anyone in uniform flying a plane over Russia anyway. It would be an act of war. We sent a civilian over there. It's an incident. Deniability. We never heard of him. So that's the reason the CIA was given the job of building the U-2. And like I said, the Korean War. Oop, back. How did I go back? The reason they picked Nevada, they looked for a place to, to test fly the uh, U 2 plane. During World War II, the, we had moved all the military, the West Coast line of defense, from California to Nevada thinking that the, the Japanese were going to invade the West Coast. The Coast Guard was at Lake Mead, the Navy was at Fallon, the Navy was at Walker Lake, the Navy was at Pyramid Lake, we had the Marine Corps was here up at Gardnerville, everyone, the Air Force had moved back here. We had all this military here in this state. We had a total of 237,000 people in the entire state. So what better place to put a little installation to do some flying? So CIA, partnered up with NASA. And so it was the cover story, it was going to be NASA, a little facility for NASA to test um, weather research planes. They're going to build a plane for NASA to get up high altitude. And the Thomas Energy Commission provided the cover. They provided the uh, uh, next to, right to the, the borders of the, uh, of the test site out there, and they were going to provide a cover. So everybody knew it was there. No big deal. It was NASA. They put NASA on the, on the tail, on the planes, everything. And it's okay, it's right inside of the, the UCL site there, it's right in the middle of all this gunnery range out there. So it's a very secure location to do something secret. And that's what it looked like in 1955. Really, really just a spot in the desert. That's our commuter plane. That's, that's how we went to work. The, the people working at Area 51 in those days, and it's still to a certain extent now, were not allowed to live in the state of Nevada. Everybody lived out of state and they commuted. And they still do today. You got a permanent party that lives here in Vegas, the people that's out there day after day after day. But you got two classes of people. You got permanent party and you got the customer. And everybody, most people were the customer. Lockheed was the customer. Navy might be the customer if they was building something. They'd come and go. They, the customers come and go. But you had a permanent party people out there they run the mess hall, the security, that, the basic thing. They, those people could live here in the state. Just to give you an idea of what it looked like in, uh, in 1955, 1956. That's the delivery of the U-2 plane. It was brought out in the C-124. We would put them together, they're on site. We, we, uh, they came disassembled. It wasn't but three boats held them together. I mean, they just, it didn't take much. The, the, the U-2 was like a butterfly. Very, very delicate. It's a, a G, uh, about a 2G plane. It, you couldn't, and the A-12 was too, when we get into the arch guard. It would, uh, put it this way, to make a U-turn at, at the speed with the A-12, the minimum turnaround distance was 85 miles. Usually it took us 125 miles to make a U-turn. 
And so this was a real problem in particularly when we started flying in Vietnam. So we didn't want to fly over China, so we had to be very careful. You get up in the Box Canyon, you might say, you didn't have room to turn around. So, so we were very careful about our, our mission planning. Notice the ladder. You're going to see a lot of ladders in the videos that I'm going to be showing here. That was our, <laughs> how we got in, in and out of the planes was a step ladder. The, uh, I'll talk about a little bit about the uh, U-2 pilots. We're going to be in our start in a minute, but the U-2 pilots was, um, they were all F-84 pilots trained, and they were in the Air Force, and they went through a screening process. Usually they were recommended, and um, CIA would interview them. They wouldn't know what job they were being interviewed for. They wouldn't even know who, who was interviewing them. And if they passed it, uh, they would, what we call sheep dipping, they would resign their commission in the Air Force and, and contract for the CIA and become actually CIA pilots. And they, uh, that was Gary Powers. And, and talking to Tony Bravaca, a good friend of mine, he was at Turner, and he, he uh, bunked with uh, Gary Powers at, at Turner. He said, one day, Gary, you just didn't show up when back come back to work. And pursued some of the others, just disappeared. No one knew where they went. Well, he got selected for the, we, we, we trained only one detachment of Air Force pilots in the U-2 at Area 51. Well, Tony was one of, the, one of them. And he got out there, and here was Gary. Here's all his old buddies at Area 51. He had no idea where it was at until then. Notice this plane. It will not land. The U-2 flat refused to land. That was uh, it's very comical to watch uh, a new pilot trying that. That was the living conditions for the U-2 people, Watertown. Very sparse. Here's something very few people knew. Six or uh, four of the um, CIA pilots was actually flying out of the Nevada test site, flying sample flights through the atomic bomb t uh, clouds. They had, a, a, the, as you'll see there, they had the lead uh, shielding on them. They had a drone plane, that's, uh, and then they, the guy in the back seat that you see in the photograph, uh, he's, he would guide the drone and they'd fly them through the mushrooms. And they had, we don't know what happened. Uh, we, one of the, I think it was the F-84, actually flew into the cloud, and they never retrieved the pilot or the plane. It vaporized him. We lost him. But this was something that very few people knew about this. And it, when I did the panel, was doing the panel with Tony at, at uh, DIA a few months ago, I brought this up. I didn't, he said, I didn't know that. So he ran by General Halloran and some of those. It was also F-84 and the U-2. U None of them ever knew that CIA pilots were flying through the atomic bomb clouds. And a lot of other secrets that we, that we even now today, is they, they, they never knew. And that's just, that's just removing the, uh, the sample practice. Now we get to the Hawks card, A-12. The A-12 is our first attempt to make a stealth plane. The CIA in insisted that it be stealth. That is a beautiful plane. Our pilots, the people that selected to, to fly the plane, never knew what they were going to fly. They didn't know where they were going to fly until they actually landed at Area 51. They opened up the hangar doors, and that's when they first learned what they were going to be flying. And we had one guy, he said, I no way I'm going to fly that. And he, he went right back to the Air Force. And that was, but this was the first flight, uh, uh, Lockheed uh, test flight named Lou, Lou Shock flew this one. For the Blackbirds, instead of having crew chiefs, some of you guys may be Air Force, you know, Air Force usually got sergeants for crew chiefs. Our crew chiefs were all Lockheed flight engineers for the Blackbirds. And I love to see these things take off. They, they're noisy. But that was working out at Area 51. This was something that the sound of the planes taking off and landing was music to our ears. Sixty-eight thousand pounds of thrust. You'll see it further in here. Each engine had more power than the Queen Mary. I'll give you an idea. 
This plane carried 80,000 pounds of fuel. There's no way it could take off with 80,000 pounds of fuel. The tires couldn't handle it or, or, um, and it couldn't take off. So it would take off about a quarter tank of uh, fuel. And the first thing to do is meet up with the tanker and take on a load of fuel. And then throughout, and notice here, it takes 560 miles to cover while he was just refueling. He started to meet the tanker 200 miles before he got to him. He would start descending and, and reducing the speed and he'd hook up with the tanker. I don't want to thank you, tell you a hanger, uh, th tanker story when this is over. There he's doing touch and goes. The titanium, they were processing it here at Henderson, at, at, at the titanium plant. And we've had a lot of problems with it. It's very um, inferior. This is the first plane we ever built out of titanium. So everything had to be invented. All of our tools, everything about it. And uh, they finally found the source of titanium that, would, um, that they wanted. It just happened to be in Russia. So somehow through a third world country, we managed to buy all the titanium for this spy plane uh, that was going to fly over Russia. We bought it out of Russia. That's a little bit about security. We're not going to talk much about security. This is a very, this is 50 years old uh, security. Uh, I wouldn't even want to guess what they got today. And some of these stormers that's going to storm every fifth one, we're about to find out. <laughs> Here's the thing we had to contend with, was atomic, our atomic bomb net neighbor. And especially for this thing tonight, I added a bunch of stuff in here to show just how to intertwine we were with our neighbor in the atomic bomb business. We were downwind of the atomic bomb test, just right off the test site. So we that evacuate when they're going to have a detonation in the, in the, you know, a few miles of us. Uh, we all wore radiation badges just like they had it at the, on the test site. Our security badges were actually issued at the test site. The only difference from our badge is we had the number eight on it. That gave you clearance to Area 51. Uh, you, you had different badges had, you know, they were, your allowance of, of clearance, each badge was different. But if you had an eight on it, you, you could go to Area 51. And we had uh, AEC people would come out and monitor. They uh, also read our, our um, um, collection of the um, dosimeters and what have you. In 1957, the U-2s moved out. We were through. They, they actually were flying in, in Europe, across Russia, what they were intended to do. I mean, within months of leaving Area 51, they were flying missions over, over the enemy. It became a ghost town. So the uh, Atomic Energy Commission came in. It became a, te uh, a, a test bed. For, it had buildings and everything, so they used it to uh, monitor exposure for the atomic bomb test. Never thought we'd come back. The only reason we came back is when we got ready to build a replacement for the U-2, which was A-12, dark chart. Lockheed happened to get the contract. And because they had uh, been there at Area 51 with the U-2, they said, we are familiar with it. We're set up there. Let's move back. And that's the only reason Area 51 stayed as it became what it is today. Here's some of the, the bombs that they set off. Hood really did a lot of damage out there. It, 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 that was a mean one. But, uh, but after a bomb, which, uh, people come back out there and they'd have the uh, fallout dust all over their desk and uh, all over everything. They'd just dust it off and go back to work. And one thing interesting is we have not had a um, health issue among our people. We, our, our guys are getting up in their 90 years old now. We have not had cancer and stuff that you think you would have having worked down when for years on, at end. You know, we worked there for years, and uh, we just haven't had that issue. I don't know, that may be part of the screening, because the, the CIA screened us so thoroughly uh, for a lot of, lot, we were different in a lot of ways. We went up there on Monday morning, came home Friday night, year after year. We worked there all week, couldn't tell our families where we worked or what we were doing. There was no divorces. I don't know of one single divorce. Now that tells you something about the selection. 
the widows of the people that we lost 60 years ago and their kids still come to our every reunion. Their Facebook, we, we, we formed a family that bonded that has never separated. And it, it's just, uh, it's very, very unusual. But it was under traditions and these were security and stuff that we were living because we believed there was five Russian spies for every one of us. We was always afraid they were going to get, try to get to us through our family. So we were so security conscious that, you know, it's just unreal. And the families were the same way. My wife here, soon be 65 years, but follow me around. <laughs> she, when she found out in 2009 where I worked, on, I was working on 85 miles away from home, she really got mad. <laughs> Because she thought I'd go into some foreign country. And that's what learned in 1968. That's our housing. We moved these in. That's a little bit better than the tents. You see the TV there. They brought, we got TV. They got to tell you about TV. We had a translator. And we got one channel, Channel 3, out of Vegas. But you'd be watching TV, all of a sudden you'd be watching bullfights in Madrid. Whatever signal was the strongest is what you were watching. So you never knew what you are going to be seeing on TV. That's our mess hall. The best food in the world. I'm not kidding. Anyone who ever worked out there in our era will say the food was the best ever. It's open 24 hours a day. You get steak, you get lobster, anything you wanted, anytime. And it... And we would actually, with, uh, with the Oshkart engine, we were, our repair depot was in Delaware. So we'd load the engines up that need some repair on, on C-130. We had a compartment built in that C-130 to bring, bring lobster and seafood back. And, and so we always had a good supply of seafood that was coming from these, these little trips. Of course, that's the bigger secret we had. That's Murphy Green, our cook, out in the middle of the lake. It did get nasty there at times. And that water wouldn't, it wouldn't evacuate, I mean, it wouldn't sink into the ground. That, the lake bed was all bent at night. The only way that water left was to evaporate. And I recall one fall, it was, uh, actually got a big rain while the, the uh, wet wind was still uh, out of the south. And the rain disappeared and it had been gone two or three months. The first north wind that we had, I mean, we got it one morning, we had a foot of water. It hadn't rained. That water had been held back on the far side of that lake uh, for three months. And the wind had brought it back. It was still there. This is a document. I don't know if you see it or not. Dated in March 1964. And it's, uh, that was the Air Force uh, support squadron that we had. And what this document contained was the, it was the handout that they gave all the people that's working out there. Where you get your, your haircuts, your, you know, all, the, all the rules. I handpicked a few. We would go to, to the Mercury for the badging, vehicle registration, our church services, our barber every Wednesday. We had a barber for $1.25 at Mercury. Our post office was there, our check cashing, and our service station. Gas was 42 cents a gallon. The Mercury was our place that we went to get our needs. Notice the name. I'm going to show this name to you several times. We're talking about a station. And I'll just tell you right now, the CIA is not allowed to have a station in the United States. You have them overseas. We had a station in Nevada. And I'll talk about that later. But I'm going to point out, and a lot of this is recent document that this is coming out in, but it's something that we all knew. You notice the security guard up there at the water uh, stack. We had a little security guard station up there. This is just some photographs of the guys working. You show, they just show the very serious work going on up there. They're not playing. Not, they're not playing around. It's very serious. What, weather reports, um, um, mission planning, that sort of thing. Notice they're all civilian clothes. Here's something note very few people knew about and knows about. They still got it today. The CIA got a domestic protection division. And it's where anything that's threatened the United States from out of the United States, it ha they handle it. Um, 
it's, uh, this is threats that the FBI and that sort of people would not be uh, tasked with. And they are the ones that labeled us as Station D of CIA. And each of the stations of the UT, here's another report, 1967 is showing the name too. Um, and you'll see there it's listed as a station along with Turkey, Japan, uh, all the different countries that they had stations. And here's good old Area 51. During the buildup of Oxcart, starting in actually 1959, the most serious work started in 1960. We had thousands of people working out there. Carpenter, you name well, Ernie here drilled their well. Stand up, Ernie. <laughs> Ernie drilled our water well out there. We had people coming, coming and going out there just day and night. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was putting in the fuel tank systems. Because the, the A-12 had a very special fuel that no other plane had. So, that, so everything was uh, going through a building phase out there. CIA people themselves. And I've got to point this out. Less than 5% of the people that worked on anything related to Area 51, including the people that were out there, knew that they worked for the CIA. They had no idea that they were working for the CIA. Because the CIA didn't go around with name stencils on his forehead. They had no idea. Um, but anyway, the CIA actually had 145 positions. 45 of them were security people. And uh, then you had your, you, you had your uh, uh, communications people and that sort of thing. So you had you know, just ordinary staff like that. And uh, the people that we had, like the Air Force, they were there for three years. The Air Force themselves, did, they worked for the CIA. The lower people didn't know that. But the, the commanders and all, they reported directly to the CIA headquarters. So General LeMay, when they started building the U-2, even though he wouldn't build it, he said, told the CIA, he said, if it works, I'm going to steal it from you. And he actually sent, sent, assigned a guy by the name of Norm Nelson, a colonel, to, to March Air Force Base, which is where the, uh, was the headquarters in the, uh, the U-2 program out of. And his job was to spy on the CIA of how, how they were advancing. Well, Norm recognized right quick he would rather be with us than with, with General LeMay. And so he ended up spending his career, he came back out as a full bird colonel for Oshkart. And he said it's the best flying club he ever attended. And he retired a two-star general. But, uh, but uh, there's a lot of infighting going on on that day. Because General LeMay, he said anything that flies ought to be Air Force. Army shouldn't be flying. CIA sure as hell shouldn't be flying. What well, he didn't realize, the CIA was flying Air America and all these. We were flying places where the Air Force couldn't go. We were in the air business. We got an air branch up there now. That's, when I go back there, that's one of the first places I visit was, is with the air branch. We still fly today places that the Air Force can't go. There in Vietnam, we flew a U-2 mission that we had, we used Taiwanese to fly it. It was so sensitive that we couldn't even, the uh, Air Force certainly couldn't do it, but the CIA did it, but they used a Taiwanese to fly it in case you got shot down just for, for deniability. We still fly places that no one else can fly today. Here's our con contractors. Now, a lot of these people did not go by their name. They had pseudo names. They went by it. They make up some name of a company, and that's how well, a lot of that's part of the secrecy because they didn't want shipments um, going to Area 51 or any place. So the shipments would be going to Massachusetts or someplace else. They'd make a big circle before they'd end up Area 51, so no one could uh, actually track what we were doing by the uh, the shipments of, of supplies that coming out there. We had a lot of camera people, as you'll see. The Defense Intelligence Agency, they're just, just now starting to declassify their role in what we did. They were major. And that's one thing I'm, I'm kind of enjoying going back there and walking them through as we've done, we've done the CIA for over the years. Uh, they're, they're kind of learning the process. But, uh, you know, the CIA is more is human intelligence, where the DI is military intelligence. 
And for example, the, the transitions are getting the MIG planes that we ended up with out there, and, and even a lot of the stuff with the U-2. The DIA was the silent partner that handled that sort of a thing. And they still haven't declassified much of what they did. The CIA didn't anticipate people living anywhere but Area 51. Four trips to the, to the uh, town a year is what they anticipated. So they put in the housing that you saw. They brought in 400 and something of those houses. We got them up at Walker Lake, the Navy head up there. And, and they furnished their towels, our bedding, linens, blankets. Our transportation was, um, and most of them flew C-47. Um, I was fortunate, I, I got to fly in Queen Air, most of, most of my flights up there. Uh, in um, 1968, as the Oshkart was moving out, the CIA was transitioning into um, the future. It went into the business of providing services to its customers for, for um, other projects. It was no longer flying spot planes. Uh, so they handpicked certain ones of it that was, you might say, exempt from a bin from the AEC or from EG&G, &G, send them back out to the test site if they short of hands. So they would do that. They would furnish the people for special projects. They'd run short on the time of bomb test, so they'd pull them out of there at 51. Well, the CIA got tired of that. They said, no more. You're, you're still going to be the prime contractor, but you will not use people from the, uh, the, from the white world. We called it the white world. We had the black world and the white world. And I've already mentioned we were not allowed to, to live in the state, most of the people. Uh, unfortunately, I did. Uh, I was already in the state when I went to work out there. This was funny. When they started making assignments for the people that Area 51, of course, they didn't know where they were going. When, once they were approved, went through all the screening at, at, back at Langley, they had to meet in some little hotel or someplace, and they didn't know whose guys were interviewing them. And most of them thought they'd been in, interviewed to become astronauts. And they'd give them all kind of tests and stuff, and they'd send them home, and they'd weed them out and bring them back and talk to them some more. And, and um, they finally said, we got a job we'd like you to do. And they said, where's that? And, well, I'm hoping to tell you, it's west of Mississippi. Mississippi. What will I be doing? I said, we can't tell you. And so and so, they couldn't tell them. And they wouldn't know. And they'd, they'd tell them, those that accept the job said, I'll do it. They assigned, like for the Air Force, they signed them to March Air Force Base. But they didn't do anything at March Air Force Base. They jumped on a, a Connie, a, a, transfer, a, a plane, and they landed in Area 51. That's the first time when they landed there, they knew where they were going to be working. And when they opened the hangar doors to show the A-12, it was the first time any of them, including the pilots, knew what they were going to be flying. And it was, uh, some of them didn't like, but anyway, when they started the, the assignments, they were uh, just like they were going to a war zone or something. The families couldn't go with them. Well, Colonel Holberry, he was commander up at, with, with a uh, B-52 squadron up in uh, Nebraska, and he brought one of his navigators down with him, Major uh, Sam Pizzo. Sam had five kids. When he got his orders, and it said, family cannot accompany you, you're going to have to stay in uh, uh, Nebraska. His wife said, and you're, but you're going to Las Vegas. His wife said, hell no. No way, Jose. For three years, you're going to be in Las Vegas. I'm in Nebraska. So he had enough rank uh, through the colonel that they quickly got that lifted. And, but they still settled the wives in, into um, uh, California, most of them. And, the, um, and that's one thing about the recruitment. The, they interviewed the families almost as much as the people they selected. If the wife drank too much, she act too much, everything, she could get you disqualified quicker than anything. They, and they, so they, look, they screened the, the families. And uh, because, we, like I say, they were trying to, afraid the Russians were going to get, get to us through our families. Mind you, the U-2 program was more highly classified than was the Manhattan Project for the atomic bomb. It was that classified. So anyway, the families got to come with them. You know, they didn't know where this was working. They'd be living in California, and the guys would get on a plane and head out to Area 51 on Monday, come home uh, Friday night. 
See how you put in bowling alleys? We had a real nice Olympic sized swimming pool. We had libraries. We had just about everything we wanted out there. They want, and like I say, the best food in the world. And you ask anyone that ever worked out there during our day, they said the best place they ever worked is the highlight of their careers. Not just the living conditions, but the um, accomplishments. We accomplished things that you know we couldn't talk about, but it, it, um, it was their highlight. We had a bar, beer bar, had three stools. Sam's Place is the name of it. Six pool tables, TV room, ping pong. As you see, we had um, we had a little golf cage. We ended up. Um, Colonel Slater brought his son. Uh, I think it's on Sun uh, Spring Break College. He brought him out there to build the uh, three-hole golf course. That was his sole job out there. That was some of our equipment that we used in special projects. It was mostly, mostly data processing because we were doing radar across sections uh, for stealth. It was mostly stealth activity that we were doing. That was my computer. That's why we, we built the A-12 plane, and as you're going to see in here, still today, the highest flying, fastest uh, piloted plane ever built. And it will never, nothing will ever surpass it because there's no need for it. Uh, they may have faster planes, but they're not going to have a man in them. They'll be unmanned. But, but, but uh, that, the record, uh, SR-71 claims the record. But that's because we were in storage for 30 years and couldn't, no one knew about us. But, but when they put the second man in the SR-71, because A-12 had one man, put the second man in the SR-71 and put his life support system in, they lost 5,000 feet of altitude. With the A-12, go back to U-2, we were very conscious of people seeing UFOs uh, 13 miles up in the sky. They'd see a flash, it'd be something, nothing's supposed to be flying that high. So we decided we'd paint the planes. Maybe they wouldn't shine and people wouldn't spot them. We lost 1,500 feet of altitude just from the weight of the plane. So, so you know, if it, we tried to make the U-2 stealth because Russia picked up every flight. We flew over Russia in U-2 for the very first one. They picked us up on radar. So we, the CIA started trying to make it a stealth plane. They, we strung piano wire on it and all kinds of stuff. And every one of them it made it shine even broader, you know, the radar see it better. But, uh, and that's the reason but we went into the A-12. They, Dick Bitzel insisted that we will have a stealth plane. And we did reduce the, the radar signature by 90%. But the A-12 plane, as you'll see in here, uh, carried 80,000 pounds of fuel. There's no way you can hide 80,000 pounds of fuel from, from a radar. Plus, in places it got up to 2,200 degrees temperature, the friction. No way, infrared would pick it up miles away. So there's no way we could make it a true stealth plane. But we learned enough on it that we went right into the half blue, which went into half uh, the 117. And we, that was the big thing of the CIA, it developed stealth. This is some old radar. This is, my, this is a Nike uh, Hercules uh, radar from Fort Bliss. God, I, I, I must have tracked a thousand missiles at White Sand shooting down the, um, our cats, drones. Uh, this was one of my babies, and uh, they sent us down to the McGregor Range where they was, had it set up, and we brought it out to uh, Area 51. And it was the primary radar that we used to track the planes as they're coming in. So one of the problems they were having, this one of the reasons they brought me out there in a rush, is they wanted to get uh, some some uh, radar cross section tracking of the A-12 in flight at Mark 3, which is 2,200 miles an hour. Faster than a rifle bullet, the plane flew. And we, these radar out there was so slow. So they brought me in, and they brought my Nike system in, and I could pick it up. Because if, if you didn't pick it up on the horizon, it's coming in so fast that the radar could, couldn't physically slew fast enough to ever catch up with it. It'd, just, it'd be gone. So you had to get on the, the horizon. But I was used to tracking missiles. So I was used to fast play. And I was tracking the S-15. For years, I tried H-15. It was almost Mark 7, almost three times as fast as the A-12. Here's what made Area 51 into laboratory. 
we picked up, the Russians, or the CIA did, some reflections of a new radar inside of Russia. It was reflecting off of ICBM, been flown on their test range. So we knew they had new radar. We're getting ready to build a stealth plane to replace the U-2. And the question is, because we knew the U-2 was going to get shot down. We figured it would last 18 months. That's the life we gave before it began to get shot down. We knew it was going to get shot down. But will the A-12 that we're building, it was, are, they going to be, are they advancing fast enough that they'll be able to shoot down the A-12? Well, the, the Russians had just started moving into Cuba. This was long before the missile crisis, 1960. We knew they were moving MiGs in there. We knew they were moving radar in there. They moved the tall king radar in there. Holy moly. So we started flying ghost planes out of Bears Air Force Base at El Paso. It was a C-97, loaded antennas and all kind of electronics, and we'd take a run at Cuba. Well, they were very paranoid. As any day, Castro was claiming that the Russians, I mean, the United States are going to invade, they're going to invade. They had the Russians until they were scared to death. Well, they turned on this radar. They'd see this plane coming in. We could electronically answer the, the radar signal, and that's what we would do. We'd make it think it's tracking two planes, 10 planes, 20 planes coming going, anything we wanted. We turned the power down, they turned their power up. What we determined was yes, they are advancing fast enough that they will shoot down the A-12 eventually. And we never flew it over Russia. But another aspect of that is uh, we, we put a big old antenna dish right outside of Morgantown, New Jersey, right off the turnpike. We aimed it at the moon. Within 30 days, we knew every radar site in Russia for reflections off the moon. So, but we but that but we never flew the U2 uh, any Blackbirds over Russia. But the little, the little uh, the one on this side, you're right. That's a mock-up that we made of the, of the uh, Tall King. We made up one our own version so we could test at Area 51 instead of having to fly to Cuba. And this is where we started doing things like this. So, so today, to get the bottom line, you know, I said it's a laboratory. If they come out with some new pod, say Texas Instruments, comes out with some new pod they want to sell the Air Force to put on B-52, that's, that's supposed to do something to detect something in China. They don't have to fly to China to see if it works. They just fly over if it's one. Because we got anything China's got, we got. Anything Russia's got, we got. We got that capability. So we are a laboratory so we can keep up with what they are doing and not have to fly and lose crew, crew people inside of their countries. And that's some of the things that we did. This was my radar site. I was a member of the Seventh Sisters when I was friend. This is up at Beatty. We were tracking the S-15, SB-70 lifting body that became the uh, space shuttle, the lunar landing. Anything that went on the Apollo went to the moon, we flew it first in X-15. It was a workhorse. And we made eight astronauts here in Nevada, flying in, over in Nevada in the X-15. And that's one of the most exciting. This is the radar I was using. This was a World War II vintage radar. This is the identical radar that we gave to Russia during the Lynn Lease program during World War II. This is what they were tracking our U-2s with. This radar had a 40-mile range at the time that we built it. We modified it. We could do 400 miles. We were tracking beacons. It's real funny because it's still on the scope. It had 40 miles on the scope, and the little blip would go off the. You go 40 miles, you go off the end. First thing, you start all over, and just <laughs> it's very antique. But that's what we were using on this fit to put guys in space. I mean, this thing, was, you pull out a chassis, it's so old that the wire was brittle, that the insulation would crumble. You didn't dare. You'd be in the middle of a tracking, and all of a sudden, your scope would go black. You knew where to hit. Bang, bang. Here it come back. <laughs> but that's how we knew that Russia was advancing this, because uh, they were using some of the stuff that we were using. This is what Lockheed Skunk Works looked like as they're building the, uh, the uh, Blackbirds. And uh, one thing unique about it is Lockheed, they didn't, their engineers weren't up on the second floor with a big fancy office. Their engineers had to be within just a few feet of where the work was going on. 
And if they run into an issue, they'd holler, hey, Charlie, get your buddy in here, out here. We got a problem. They dealt with it right then, right then. You didn't do a memo. You didn't have a board meeting. You did it right then. Another thing that we unique about us in those days, they talk about meetings. We did not allow a pencil and paper in a meeting. Because everything we did was top secret. If you even do the Mickey Mouse on there, that's a top secret document, and you had to go through all kind of headaches to get it classified. So we didn't, we didn't take notes, and that's the reason today I spent so much time back at Langley, me and different ones, going back and telling them what the hell we did that we didn't tell them about. <laughs> this is our partners. You mentioned that we had customers. These were our customers out there, and, they, and they'd come and go. They'd have different projects. You'd have an aerospace company. You might even have a university that had a grant a government grant to do something that needed to be done out there. And they'd come out there, they would be a customer, and, and, and we, we would take care of them. And, they, um, and quite often, we didn't know who they were. And none of our business it was a need to know. They didn't know us. We used the code name, I was Thunder. They knew us, hey, go see Thunder, he'll, he'll help you out, you know. Uh, we just didn't name for it imported. And uh, we'll talk more about that. This is the A-12, when it was made in stealth. This is one of the part of my project. And you see it's sitting on two uh, battleship drive shafts uh, welded together. Look at the shadow. Every time the, the Russians would send a satellite over, we would even know what kind it was. Well, they knew it was there, they're spy owners. If it's, if, if it's RF seeking, we shut down all our emissions, shut down the radar and communications. But it's the infrared, we had to move the plane off the pylon and put it under, under a shed. And any other planes we had out on the tarmac or coming into the land, we had what we called hoot and scoot sheds. And we screwed them in that shed right quick so that satellite wouldn't pick them up. Years later, many years later, we realized, the Russians told us, we knew all along what the hell you doing. Infrared picked up your shadow because it was a different temperature. And they knew exactly what we did. We worked 16 months. We moved that thing in and out. <laughs> and you're going to see what a job that was later here. This was my, the brown buildings where I worked. And you can't see much detail. We got just about every radar known to man sitting there in that, what we call the rat scat. And uh, uh, mine, uh, my Nike was that little bitty van that you see attached to the building. This is some of the, I want you to look at step ladders. We, you saw the U2 guy getting in the plane with a step ladder. We love step, step ladders. OSHA would hate us. <laughs> Talking about the pole, we had we, the pylon, this is officially called the pylon. We call it the pole. We had a lot of different types of poles. Um, and uh, we were notorious, my group was, for um, seeing what different planes looked like on the radar. And this became kind of a hobby uh, of us. And we became notorious for putting planes on the on radar. This is what we would get uh, from our uh, scanning with the radar. And you see the big reflection. This happened to be a MiG-21 that we, we were scanning here. But what we was working on, they would take it back uh, we give them this little graph here. They'd see what parts of the plane was uh, given the big return. They'd work on it maybe two or three months and bring it back. We'd put it back on the pole again, look at it with all this radar again, and get another print out. And hopefully it had diminished, it changed, maybe it's showing up different somewhere else. And they'd take it back and do a little more tweaking on it. We, get it, we got it down. We've done one, I can't tell you what plane it was, but they, uh, it, never had a, it never had a name. But um, it, it became the F-117 and the half blue. But anyway, they, uh, we got it down to, it, uh, where, uh, to see what part of the plane we were looking at. We'd have to put a, a thumbtack in it to get a ping. We'd give us a reference. It was the right wing or whatever, where we put it. We got it down to where the, um, a bird landed on the plane, on the prototype, showed up more than the, the plane. 
We got down to where the, even the pole that it's sitting on was getting us too much background noise. So we built styrofoam poles, big old chunks of styrofoam columns, and we'd make them in, in circle, take a heating iron or a heating thing, element and whip them down, you know, make them round, and that's what we'd put our prototypes on to reduce the background noise. Now, mind you, this is 60 years ago. You can only imagine what they do now. But, the, but this is some of the things we're doing. But we put everything we get our hands on because we were bored out there. For that three months, that, 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 that plane, you know, we wouldn't see that customer for three months. He went back, he was making changes. We're sitting out there all week long with a bunch of engineers, had all the toys to play with, but was curious, you know, naturally because we, the only reason we were recruited for out there. So we would find a plane sitting out there and we'd put it on the pole. Just get, and pretty soon we realized we were onto something. Every plane had a different radar signature. And it actually became a, pro, a program later. And we actually developed the technology, but it came out of just boredom. Us, you know, and, but I've got to tell you a story. We, you know, we're right in the middle of the gunnery range out there. And the, uh, the, air, the of course, the Air Force guys out there on the gunnery range would see there's no fly zone. They call, they call this the box. And no fly zone, every 51, big old 12,000 foot runway. So one day a young pilot, he decided he would land there. He was curious. And he landed and, you know, we chewed him out and, and sent him on his way. Boy, he got back to Nellis and he said, boy, that's pretty neat. Y'all see what you got out there. We had another one land, F-105. We kept the pilot two weeks debriefing him, but we wouldn't give Nellis their plane back. <laughs> And we put the plane on the pole, took a picture of it, and sent it to Ellis. <laughs> that stopped all the emergency flights. <coughs> you saw us moving the U-2 in, in the belly of the C-124. To move the A-12s, we actually built these boxes at Lockheed. And we, we hauled 18 loads of them, eight miles an hour in places. CIA furnished the guards, the highway patrol was the escorts. Had one incident, we had a Greyhound bus run into one of the boxes. And the CIA handles it the way they usually do. The, the, money, the money bag came up, gave the driver $5,000 cash, told him to keep on driving. That's what he did. We, anytime we had an incident, there's always money. And I'll tell you some more stories on that. But we made 18 cents. Can you imagine us tying up the highway for, for, and think about those houses we moved, 400 and something houses we moved from Hawthorne. I mean, we tore up traffic terribly. Of course, we didn't have that much traffic back then. Here's the J-58 engine. This was a miracle. They actually got this engine where it would fly above 100,000 feet. Uh, the A-12, none of the Blackbirds ever flew that high, but the plane, the, the, the uh, engine itself could have taken them there. Uh, as I said, it burned, or it burned 65,000 pounds of fuel an hour, a lot of fuel. And it took two J-58, uh, two uh, uh, Buick engines, they were tied together, and they would twirl the engine enough to get it started. But that alone wouldn't do it. The fuel was so heavy, they had to have a special fuel because the, uh, the fuel tank would get up to maybe six, eight hundred degrees. So you weren't about to put gasoline or kerosene or something like that in there. So we had a special fuel that you couldn't light it with a match. And the, so the way we would get the fuel to ignite is when the Buick started cranking up the engine, we had a chemical that we just, like a, a starter fluid or something, that we spray. The minute it hit oxygen, it, it would explode. It just, and it, so those explosions would, would get the fuel hot enough, a few squirts of that, and once it ever started, then it, it would be off and running. But that was um, uh, one of the things on the, on the engines there. Beautiful engine. We had a lot of issues with the A-12 that I'll talk to briefly about that they did not have with the SR-31. Show you a little bit of the temperature. Give you an idea, a, a Mach 2.5 plane will get up, maybe at maximum, get up 450 degrees, period. We went up to Mach 3, and you're talking 2,200 degrees. You're talking about a windshield, 800 degrees. Think about the camera we're carrying on that. And we'll go into the camera a little bit. You got the camera to cover. It's getting up 1,100 degrees. What, the, what kind of material are you going to use that can handle that? And of course, the titanium could handle the temperature. 
In fact, the more heat, the more heat it got, the stronger it got. Titanium was just a, but, but the issues with titanium. It was a learning curve. Like I said, we had to invent every tool we ever made. Take a felt pen, mark out there where you go to do something the next day. You come back there, and that chemicals in that felt pen would have etched into the skin, just the chemicals. We had weldings that we started to notice some of the welding was failing, and we finally figured it out it was only the planes that was built during the summer. The planes built during the winter, no problem. And what the problem was is that uh, during the summer, well, we hosed them down to clean them. Well, Lancaster would put uh, chlorine in there during the summer, up the chlorine in the water. It was the chlorine effect, chemical effect on that titanium with its effect of welding. Just stuff like that. We just, it was ungodly, the little things. We could never, ever stop the, the fuel tanks from leaking. Now, they wouldn't leak in flight because they expand. But on the ground, it leaked like a sieve. <laughs> the minute they landed, you put flat, uh, pans under them. And we was never able to come up with a, anything that could allow the expansion and, and handle the chemical involved in, that's in the fuel that could handle that and, and last. So we always had a leaking, leaking plane. That's a beautiful picture. I'm sitting in Area 51 that, oh, just before we retired them. The second one in the row is the, the trainer. It's got the second cockpit in it. A little bit of history about the A-12 planes. No Air Force pilot ever flew one of these operational A-12s, ever. Lockheed flew them, the test pilots, and the CIA pilots did. The Air Force pilots, the way this worked, Lockheed pilots trained your instructor pilots, which were Air Force. They used the trainer. They flew the trainer, and they would teach the CIA pilots how to fly. But the Air Force never flew in the um, A-12. Uh, the SR-71 was never at Area 51. You're always hearing that uh, SR-71, Area 51. It was never there. It was strictly at Edwards and then Beale Air Force Base. Uh, this is a, I'm really interested on this. This is actually a painting. This came from CIA. You'll notice the CIA on their publications and whatever never uses a real photo. They use a painting because they can add something to it if they want to or they can take more so they can take something off. It, it protected the painting that they don't want the enemy to know we got. It's not on there. It's a, so they don't use photos in their publication. It's always a painting. I love the rear end of this thing. That's it, A-12. Big engines, fuel tank. And there's, there it is with the uh, tanker. The tanker was the only plane that, that when we went operational in, in, in Vietnam, that was the only plane that the A-12 pilot would communicate with. He was otherwise he'd black out. He could talk to his tanker. But that was it. And then if he had a message to relay back to the CIA headquarters or back to Cardina or anywhere, the tanker would do the, the transmission. Now for my, now for my uh, tanker story. And this was an SR-71, not an A-12. Had this pilot was flying right around the, the outskirts of, uh, of the Soviet Union one night. Just routine mission. He was getting very, very low on fuel. Really sweating. And God, I hope that tanker's on time. You know, hope he's there. And he started dropping down his temperature, I mean his altitude, a couple hundred miles before he was supposed to meet the tanker. And right on cue, boy, he sees those blinking lights up there. And he's, thank God, because I'm just about out. Who's up behind it? It was a Russian bomber. He and he was up behind a Russian bomber. I don't know which one of messed her pants first. But, <laughs> but he found his tanker. He was, but that bomber just happened to be in the, in, in the area where that tanker was supposed to be. But that was, I thought that was so funny because don't tell them what those Russians thought. And I'm sure that pilot in the uh, SR-71 was, uh, oh, whoa. That's just the cockpit show of the plane. Pretty big cockpit. That gives you an idea of some of the people out there. There's Air Force support, some um, just the people, people picture. Talk about the pilots. So only 14 was selected to fly the A-12. 
One of them, the minute he saw the plane, no way, Jose, he backed out. One of them, he just couldn't hack it. He was a good pilot, I mean, a good guy and all. And they finally just had to fire him. You know, you're just not cut out to fly this. We had a third one. He went through all the stages. On a Friday afternoon, General Sullivan was the one that took him up to fly. And he broke Mark III, which was a big deal. He's Mark III certified. The minute he was Mark III certified, they never saw him again. He left the CIA. He wanted to get a job with... Uh, uh, as a test pilot on the Blackbird. And uh, he just wanted that Mark III. All he wanted was that certification. No one would hire him. I mean, the word got out just like that, and he never found a home. The, uh, we flew 2,850 missions, sorties out of Area 51, with the A-12 that no one knew about. I mean, that's a lot of flying. Sometimes we would be seen with a with flash, just like with the U-2. Uh, they'd be reported as a UFO sighting. Uh, Project Blue Book would start investigating if they started getting too close. But say, son, usually the major or captain, that's a classified project. Make up a story and go home. And that's what they do. That's, that's as far as you can go. Uh, the, uh, every now and then, we, we try to pl plan all of our flights where no one would see us. You know, we went to a lot of trouble because a, a normal uh, training flight would take off every 51 would head up toward Idaho and the worst job in the world we had one Lockheed guy he lived on a lake bed up there in, in a camper trailer his only job was record the sonic booms that came over his, we called him Boomer poor old Boomer he stayed up there for months but anyway we'd fly up to Idaho usually back make a loop around Albuquerque and then depending on where we was going out, out in the ocean or something we'd head out and again, you're talking about just a few minutes at 2,200 miles an hour. It doesn't take you long to do that. Um, the, the CIA called us, all of us pilots were drivers. The planes were articles, and the camera was the package. And each of the pilots had what we call a Dutch number, Dutch 21, Dutch 23. And that, so if, like, Frank Murray flying uh, Article 1, Three one, it'd be, it'd be Dutch twenty one flying Article one three one, no names. They didn't identify the, plan, the pilot or the plane. They used pseudo names. The pseudo names, the CIA got them off of gravestones in Europe, and their actual their paychecks, everything came in that name. They they didn't use their real names. They just like the rest of us used code names. Now we didn't. All the, my group didn't use pseudo names. But, the, but the Air, all the Air Force guys had pseudo names, full pseudo names. Lot, most of them would use their same first name and just use the last name for convenience. You don't need to read this, but this is interesting. Um, this is a document that's uh, dated 1963 to declassified in 2007. About three weeks ago, I was working with some of the SR-71 guys, a couple of generals, and and some of the wing commanders and stuff, we were trying to put a list together of all the people that had qualified in the planes but never flew operational. Because we keep a roster. Uh, I work with Bill Air Force Base and a, a group of us, and we keep it current every month. We get a report on who all is flying the U-2. And, of course, we're not flying the Blackbirds anymore, but we keep these records so that if we get inquiries or something, we've got a record to go back to. Well, suddenly the webmaster for the SR-71 guy a couple of weeks ago got a hold of me and said, God, you guys, we've got a new guy that flew the Blackbird. We'd never heard of him. But I didn't recognize the name either, but I was suspicious of what it was. So I got a hold of Dr. Robard, the CIA, and he had to look it up. And it was Colonel Holberry. Well, Dr. Robard didn't know who Colonel Holberry was, so I had to inform him he's the first base commander. But it, it, that was Holberry's pseudo name. And it was in this report, he had made his third flight. And, it, and so what was interesting, these people I was working with, the generals, whatever, on this other program, I thought, I don't know if they know about this. So I sent it to them. They had never known, did never know that we were using pseudo names. All these years, they did not know that we used pseudo names, because the Air Force didn't. We run into stuff like this all the time. This is what the pilots look like. 
the, uh, most of them, what happened when they, the program was over, you know, they resigned their commissions. When the program was over, the Air Force tore up their resignations as though they never existed, promoted them to whatever rank they should be at this time. And we had a general that was attached to the CI, Jack, Let, Jack, uh, Jack Ledford. He made sure that our guys all got their due promotions. And they got, got time for the time spent in the CI, which counted as Air Force time. So they got their retirements, they got their promotions. A couple of them made two-star generals, most of them made colonel. The sixth and the flu operational in Vietnam earned the CIA's Intelligence Star for Valor. That's the highest award the CIA gives. I'm pointing this out for a reason. Later on, you're going to see why I'm giving credit. I mean, the accomplishments of these guys. One of them was a, 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 his widow received it, and I'll tell you the story on that. The 1129th Squadron that was supporting the CIA, they got the uh, Outstanding Unit Award. By all records, that unit never left Boeing Air Force Base. It was never at Area 51. It never existed for anything other than the, the Oshkart program. They formed it for Oshkart and dissolved it at the end of it, but it never left Boeing. That's what a photography looked like at 90,000 feet. We could read the car tag on, on a vehicle. And imagine that going that fast. And those temperatures on, a, on your heat, uh, heat lens and all, being able to get that kind of photography. That's the four button family members of the, of the uh, Blackbirds. Everybody knew about this, Star 71, but they didn't know about the others. The, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, the others here. You notice that the, one of them's got a uh, pointed uh, nose instead of the, the chimes. That's because it's got an antenna there. It was designed to shoot missiles and shoot down planes. The M21, we built drones. And we, we, actually flew, we actually flew these over China. They were going to detect uh, atomic bomb activity, is what, what their purpose was. We started out with trying to retrieve them. They, they would uh, actually, the camera took its, the package took its uh, photographs. The, the, um, the drone would drop the package off, and supposedly we would catch it in a net behind a C-130. That didn't work. Never caught one. <laughs> so finally, we, we decided the. Um, we would catch them at sea. This, uh, we would fly over China and then bring them back out over the ocean, and then uh, we'd drop them off and ship, pick them up. We finally had one successful mission. We got these things thrown all over China. China's got a whole museum of our D-21s. Right? <laughs> we lost a lot of them. But we finally had a mission to succeed. Drop this package, y'all, boy, right the ship's right there. The damn captain run over the package and sunk it. That was the end of that. But um, it was a good idea. There's going to be more about the D-21 later at the very end of this. That keep in mind that the first flight was in 1964, and you'll see a photograph here in a minute of what it really looked like. As I said earlier, the A-12 um, is actually the fastest plane, highest flying plane ever built, even though the SR-71 claims the records. And there you see some of the stats that uh, they were very close to the same, but the, um, uh, we had a little bit of higher mark number, and there uh, we had 5,000 feet more of altitude. And one of the big differences is the SR-71 is a two-seater. That gives you a little idea of the comparison of them. The biggest difference in the um, SR-71 is it had a longer tail. Uh, not sure what that's about, but it, it, aerodynamics. We almost didn't go operational. 1966, Black, McNamara was wanting to shut us down. He didn't like the CIA. We weren't supporting him and Johnson in Vietnam. They wanted the war, CIA didn't. CIA said, stay the hell out of there. You, you don't want this. And so we weren't cooperating, so they did everything they could to take everything away from the CIA they could. So they decided that they would sh shut us down before we ever went operational. And this little thing here was uh, our draftsman, Sammy Gamble. He passed away here a couple, three years ago, lived here in Vegas. He was our draftsman. He drew that, and it shows you can't see it in the, uh, 
up there, but they shot all of our names up there as the birds. We're all, everything's going all to hell. But we got a reprieve. The SR-71 was not ready to fly, yet we were needing to know what missile sites in Vietnam. We needed that now. The SR-71 wasn't ready. So they actually started, some of our people had already left, and they had to bring them back in. And we sent three planes from Area 51 to Kadena to fly into Russia, or I mean, Vietnam. And we'd rotate our people every two weeks, rotate back and forth between Area 51 and Kadena. And uh, but this shows a little bit, we, it reduced our people down to uh, 1,500 people, military and civilians. SR-71 finally arrived in uh, Kadena. And they looked up on the hill and here's some planes that look just like theirs. They didn't know who, who in the hell is that. They didn't know about the A-12. The Air Force did not know about it. And they, so they called it Brand X. Uh, they finally figured out it was CIA. But they, until they got there, they had no idea that the CIA was um, flying these missions. We retired in 1968, and there they were in a... They sit until 1991, a little cocoon. And we kept them, we thought we might need them again, and then finally, 1991, they decided, uh, we got the SR, we, we, we won't need them. This fellow, he was one of the... In uh, 1971, I mean, when flying a regular mission at Edwards, I suddenly got a, had an engine explosion followed by a fire warning light. That a, that's too bad. A picture of the 34 miles away. Wind, variable 180210 degrees, 10 gust, 18. Roger, I'm going to have to make a right turn there. I'm going to have to use burner to keep this speed up. I'm going to get in. You can see the fire coming out the right engine. As the film progresses, you'll notice the fire gets bigger and bigger. When you see the ejection, you'll see the back seat radar operator go out first and then followed approximately three or four seconds later by myself. Fire burned through the hydraulic lines, and I lost my hydraulic Dutch pressure. Dutch Bravo 388, unable to issue departure release this time. 88 Romeo, orbit to the east over there. Emergency in progress. Do not cross the final approach to Duke. No, he I lost my hydraulic pressure. The control flows up, and the I left east. me no, no choice except to bail out. Tower, Spartan. Dutch 72 Tower, there appears to be flames coming out from the right side of the aircraft. As you see the ejection sequence, we have an actual rocket motors underneath the seats that propel us out of the airplane. Last one is me. Attention all aircraft in the Edwards area. The aircraft YF-12. The crew has ejected from the aircraft. The aircraft is over the east lakeshore at this time in a right turn. It was a sick feeling watching that beautiful airplane go crashing into the earth like an atom bomb. Notice your cross on there, I'll explain what that is. Glad I'm closing.
it's still in it. This young fellow on my left is Major Billy Curtis, who is my radar operator in the back seat. We landed in our parachutes not far from Highway 58, where a passerby who saw our descent drove over to see if we were all right. I had scooped up a mouthful of sand while being drugged by the parachute, but otherwise I felt reasonably well. That night, however, I really felt the effects of the landing impact. I clutched the walls and hung onto the door handles trying to make it down the hallway to the bedroom. In the morning, I didn't really expect to be able to get out of bed. I, I figured I'd be so stiff I couldn't walk, but actually, I felt much better. Uh, right after the <clears throat> bailout, they took me into the hospital for a quick checkover. While I was there being checked, I got a commander from General Bob White of X-15 fame telling me that he'd just received word from ADC headquarters that I'd been promoted to full colonel. He said, I wasn't supposed to tell you this till tomorrow. But uh, just so you'll feel better about the loss of that airplane, I'm telling you now. Okay, you saw the cross on the bottom of that plane. In 1965, Lyndon Johnson was just dying to announce that we had a Mark III plane. He wanted to intimidate the Russians and use it for his political purposes. One day, CIA to fly, use A-12, and CIA just flat refused. I mean, they, I, I've seen the correspondence on it. And they told him, if you want a, fl a, a, fly, a speed record, use the YF-12. It's an Air Force plane. The CIA helped develop it. It's still, still at Area 51. And it was a plane built to, for the purpose was to uh, arm it with missiles and be able to intercept Russian bombers as they were coming, before they ever got into the continental United States. At Mark III, it could be in their borders and nothing flat. So that's, that was the purpose of the Y-12. So anyway, we, we decided to use the Y-12 for the speed run. I think it was May the 5th, 1965. We, uh, I participated in it from the Nellis, I mean, for the uh, Bay radar site. But we had a speed run, and we had the French come over to be the referees so that uh, they could verify that, uh, the speed. And they painted that cross on the bottom of it so that we couldn't switch planes during the flight. That's, uh, that's so the French could be assured that it was the same plane that, uh, that, that left that came home. But that was, that was the purpose of the, the, the cross. The D-21, this is our drone. We talked about the drones a little bit more, a little bit earlier. And they were gonna fly over, over China. Here's what a drone flight looked like. We launched it off the mothership at Mark III, and it'd, it'd go up to Mark IV. And keep this drone in, in mind, because later on in here, you're going to see some, someone dispute this, the purpose of it, and a few other things, the year that flew. This ended us using the A-12 as a mothership, and it, we turned it over to started launching them off B-52, which you'll see the reason why. These engines we had in the, in the plane and in the drone itself, we had a lot of problem with the air intakes. You got um, air coming in at, at, mock, at mock speeds, and before it could go into the compressor, we had to slow, slow it down to subsonic speeds. And uh, we just had a hard time ever getting the balance on that. And what would happen, the engine would still be running, but it loses its thrust. It's just sitting there, but it's not pushing. We, we call it an unstart. And that's what happened in this plane. And um, the uh, Bill Park survived the crash, but Lee Torque, we never knew whether he was too injured to get into his little right life, life raft that went out with him, or did he open his face mask too soon? That's what we suspected. Anyway, he drowned. So we got the Coast Guard out, at, out here at um, Lake Mead. They were still here at the time. They had the, the whalers out there and some parasails. And we 
and it turned into quite a boondoggle. We had, some of these guys you see in baby suits are, are flight surgeons. We had everybody in this dog out there. This is fun. This is really a lot of fun. But anyway, we turned these pilots up in these parasails and we dropped them off. We are going to teach them water survival. But the wind got up and we, we drove Jared Layton halfway across the lake. Slips later, he almost drowned. So we finally decided, boys, we knocked it off. If you hit the end of the water, <laughs> you better keep your, keep your helmet on or you're going to drown. But anyway, a little funny story, story about it. We had the Charlie Trap with our helicopter pilot out there. And he's flying around out there, and we had these nude beaches back in the, scattered all over Lake Mead out there. <laughs> had a loudspeaker on his um, helicopter. Naughty, naughty, naughty. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of fun out there. That was quite a day. Denny Sullivan was the only one, this is the only blackbird of any of them that ever got struck by a missile. And actually he ran into it. So the, the, they would shoot at us, but they, they couldn't detect us in time to activate their missile batteries. And that was the problem with the radar. And that's the reason when you eventually, they would with the tall king, they would be able to pick us up in time. Hey, here they come and get ready. But what it was back then, they didn't have that amount, much time. And they'd shoot at us and... Uh, uh, and then they got where they shoot up ahead of us and hope we run into the debris. But the missiles themselves, we had a good ECM electronic counter uh, measures on it, and we could uh, confuse the missiles where they wouldn't strike the plane. But even if one missed the plane and went up and, and reacquired it, it came back down, and he'd catch up with the plane behind him, and the proximity fuse would, would detonate the warhead. But we're going so fast that we outrun the blast. We never feel it. <laughs> you see a big flash behind you. Well, that was close. But, but this, this, this was the only fragment, and we found this only when we landed. And we, we mounted it in plastic. And about four years ago, I presented this to the CIA. It's in their museum. Uh, very meaningful, because that's, that's the only one. This is some of the major advance. And Johnson insisted that he going to announce that we got a Mark III plane, brag about it. McNamara ordered all the uh, tools destroyed so that we couldn't rebuild it. And the last flight was in June 1968. We put them in storage. Some of the things your CA accomplished at Area 51. With the U-2 plane, we proved that the Russians were not superior to us in bombers and missiles by overflying them. And that, that enabled our president and all of our planters to... Uh, plan ahead. We produced a 12 reconnaissance plane, which was the first stealth design plane. The fastest plane, pilot jet plane ever built. It located the U.S. Pueblo. When North Korea seized the Pueblo in 1968, Jack Weeks flew the first mission, and he found it in the harbor. And then Frank Murray, two weeks later, flew a second mission to see if it was an incident or are we, we going to war? Are they mobilizing? He actually flew into China, which we won't admit to, to see if China was mobilizing. What the hell's going on? And, and um, well, we won't have time for the stories on that, but that was the, um, what we did with PFLO, and then we flew one final mission just before the, uh, we retired the planes. Vietnam, we located the SAM sites. That was the uh, purpose of going over there. Very successful, we located them all. And it inspired the, the building of the other uh, planes. But the CIA stayed there after quit flying. And this is the thing that uh, a lot of people wondered, what did they do? But we were very, very deep into stealth. We were really into developing stealth. Plus, we had started uh, exploiting the enemy aircraft of the uh, particularly the Soviet Union. In Vietnam, the kill ratio was 9 to 1 against us. And we had the new MiG-21 that the Russians had showed up with, that the North Vietnamese was flying. We were giving credit to the, to the, the, to the new plane. Uh, we got our hands on one, uh, a pilot in Iraq, the affected with one to Israel. Israel loaned it to us, and we tore it down to see how they built it, put it back together, and then we started flying it. And the uh, Navy came in first, and they flew the F-4s and whatever they had against it. We got a 100% kill against the Navy on their first try. Within two weeks, or I mean two months, the Navy had initiated 
uh, Top Gun Weapons School, two months. They completely turned the kill ratio around. In Vietnam, we lost 15 planes in one day and didn't shoot down a single one. Navy completely turned the kill ratio. They quit losing planes. It took the Air Force a couple more years before they got what, smart, and they started doing the same thing uh, with, with uh, Red Flag. And what we realized out of the program, it takes 10 missions for a pilot to learn enough in the combat zone that he might survive the war. We said, let's quit sending them over there with no training. Let's give them those 10 missions here in Nevada. And that's exactly what we did. We actually formed a MiG squadron at Tonopah. We, and we flew nothing but MiGs. And our, our pilots would go up, the first time they'd see one, they'd get buck fever. They wouldn't know it. they was going up against a MiG. They'd see one. And then, then, then they, we would do controlled maneuvers, do this, do that, and they learn what the capabilities of the plane, what it could do, couldn't do. You learn real quick, don't get in it, don't circle with him. He's gonna get you. If, you. if you don't get him on the first try, don't try again, he's gonna get you. If he gets on your tail, go up or go down. Do not circle, he can outturn you. I mean, and, and so that's some of the things we learned. And you think about it, we, 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 this was the Red Eagles. And, uh, Colonel Gail Peck was the start squadron. We haven't lost a plane in air-to-air -air combat in several wars. Wars. We don't lose planes in air-to-air -air combat anymore. And we lost 15 in one day. We were sending our guys over there with no training. Just as just simple as that. And, but that's what we, that's one of the thing, main things we accomplished out there that I was very proud of. And we got our hands on a couple of uh, Mir-17s in 1969 during the Six Day War. Uh, a couple of Syrian uh, planes, uh, pilots, got confused and landed on Israeli airstrip. Thank you. We appreciate it. And we ended up with those Air 51. And uh, that was Project Hadrill and Half Ferry. And we knew quite a bit about the MiG-17s already. But even with them, we were shooting down the F-4s and whatever that the, the Navy and Air Force was flying at the time. But what we would do, we would try out like a, we'd have a B-52 B bomber flyover. And we would put the MiGs up against him to see if he was going to be able to, to um, get rid of them. And it would. The ECM would work. Am I running over time? Uh, we're just going to ask some questions and pass it around. Okay. And um, I'll pass around the mic. Anybody have any questions? Anybody have any? All right. Hi, thanks for your work. Uh, quick question, what was the max head count at 51 in the late 60s before it started to go down? I'm uh, sorry? What was the maximum head count up at 51 that was based up there continuously? <sighs> Well, back there in the construction stage, there's probably maybe as many as 5,000 people there as they were building, but moving the buildings in and building the hangars and that sort of thing. But, once it, but the permanent party people is in the low hundreds. Uh, there wasn't that many people. And it's always been a transit f uh, facility. Uh, a lot of these people, say a Pratt Whitney guy, they were working on the engines. One of the engineers, he may spend only one day in his entire career at Area 51. But he'd have a problem, he would go up there. So the people were coming and going. They didn't stay there. You had your permanent party, which is my 23 of us in my group. You had your communications, you had your cooks and people like that. But most of the people were transit people, they'd come and go. Questions? Yeah, the TD. Of the pilots that, I'm sorry. Of the pilots that you said that went out to the hangar and they saw the A-12 for the first time and they said, no, I don't want to fly that, were they reassigned and not able to speak about seeing that aircraft? Yeah, they, they, they could never speak about seeing the aircraft. And the, uh, yeah, they went right back into the Air Force and the, it affected their careers. Now the one that, that, that turned it down, he ended up making three-star general, so he, it didn't hurt his career. But the, the pilots themselves, that flew in the, in the planes, they were not allowed to go into the Vietnam War for about two years because they, they, they wanted that much time to pass uh, because of the thing to see. Another example, we had the, Frank Murray had to sit down uh, A-12 in their, uh, uh, Thailand. And the, um, 
uh, Air Force colonel that came out, the first time when he got the uh, cockpit open, Frank handed him a, a clipboard with a non-disclosure uh, a form for his sign where he couldn't say or tell what he'd seen. That ended that colonel's career in Vietnam. He was never able to fly another mission because he had seen something that he wasn't supposed to see, and if he got captured, you know, you get it out of him. That was similar to what my father went through in World War II. He was in the Navy and was assigned to work with the top secret radar system that we received from the British in Missouri. And they were taught in school that if you made one mistake or opened your mouth about one thing about the radars, you would not be able to go outside of the United States. You would never leave a desk. You'd never be able to go anywhere for the branch of service that you came into. Yeah, this, this, this is probably true. It was true. And the last question, was there ever an A-11? Uh, yeah, the A-11 was, um, I, actually, the, I think the uh, YF-12 actually became the A-11. We went through A-1, A-2, A-3, we went through the stages. The A-12 was just a, the 12th version of it. Yes, there was an A-11, but it wasn't, um, uh, I think that's the one we end up calling the YF-12. Do we have any other questions? Um, in Tonopah with the MiGs, a kind of a double question, um, they were all painted different colors, all the MiGs, and I was thinking, was that so that our pilots would be able to look at them in the sky and see which ones were harder to see? That's the first part. And the second part was, um, was Tonopah really considered a Russian base because of all the Russian flags and the Russian uniforms and everything else Russian. Yeah, the, the painting, I, I think the, the painting was just whatever the, they came from different countries. So the painting varied on them. You notice the one we had at Area 51, we actually put um, Air Force stickers on them. We assigned them a Air Force number and everything so we could talk about them and no one, no one would talk about a MiG. But the, at Tonopah, they kept them just like they received them and, and they got it from different countries. They, so that the, uh, we trained the pilots at Tonopah to fly like Russians. We did not want them flying like Americans. So we actually sent them to other countries. Uh, so I think I can tell, you know, I can't talk much about this. We sent them to Samoa, for example. They, the Samoan Air Force were trained by the Russians. They were flying Russian MiGs. So we sent pilots over there to train them to use, to learn their tactics. So that when, when and then as they started sortie out at uh, Tonopah, they would actually play the Russian national anthem. You're a Russian today, you're Russian, Russian, fight like a Russian. So our guys did not make a mistake and do like American. They wanted the guys on the other end to see the real thing. So we would actually use Russian tactics so we give them experience on the, on the real thing. But yeah, we, we called, uh, in fact, Area 51 was called Red Square for a while because of the MiGs. How deep was your involvement with the uh, engineers at, at Lockheed? I, I wasn't, uh, really. Uh, we, we didn't really work with them uh, hardly at all. We were more into the stealth, and, and, and uh, I was particularly more into the Soviet stuff. I did, even while I was in the Army, I had... Uh, gotten in Russia, involved with Soviet uh, equipment. And during the Six-Day War, along with the MiGs that we got from uh, uh, Israel, we got a ton of radar. And that's one of the things we needed for the stealth. We would actually get their radar sets working so that we could look at whatever we're flying to see if it, it really is stealth. We, we need to see for ourselves what the Russians were gonna see. So we would use their equipment to uh, to, to track it and look at it. So we had, we had a lot of their equipment out there. We have one more question. So in 1991, the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union sort of dissolved, turned into Russia. Was there, did you have any interaction after that with sort of the people that were on the other side during the Cold War? You know, sort of like, Maybe after World War II, you might have 
Americans meeting Germans, you know, 10 years later and going over old stories. Oh, that's what it was like on the other side. So do you have any stories like that? I, I didn't know. They, um, first this way, I, I, I was told even just a few years ago, I still couldn't go to Russia. And I, I, don't, I think that's we were a little overboard, but um, uh, no, we, we were in the stuff that um, we still can't talk about with the Russians or people like that. There, there are some things that um, we still can't talk about along that line. We, put it, we, we did things we weren't supposed to, we won't admit to it. <laughs> so can I ask everyone to just thank T.D. Barnes for being here with us tonight? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we do have some refreshments outside, and, and T.D. will be here and his lovely wife, and you can ask questions, but before we go, we have a few things for you. First of all, this is an atomic pen. It is for your next book. All right. We want the whole thing in longhand. Very good. <laughs> um, and then a little bit of fun, oh. Area 51. Okay. And then this is a very special one about Area 51 that we've decided we'll just give you in a red bag. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I think that outside of so many th pieces around technical inspiration, you know, what I personally heard throughout this presentation was that it's about family and friends. It's about working for a higher mission and being focused on what you're doing. And if anyone says that the, the new world started 10 minutes ago with rapid prototype and taking things to market, I think we know they're wrong. I think it started decades ago, and we are understanding that more and more every day. So thank you very much for reminding yep. us that History is everything we do every day, and that um, we didn't invent it yesterday. Thank you very much. We look. You are. So please. My pleasure. So, so please join us in the lobby for refreshments and obviously opportunity to talk one on one with TD and his lovely wife. You know, before, before you go, there's one uh, one little thing here. You might want to hear from the expert on Area 51. By the way, those of you who haven't been up on the Mount Charles, and this is the memorial that we did for the Area 51 veterans. And this is us back at CIA headquarters where we presented the, um, th this last year with the, uh, the people. There's what we put up for Ray, uh, Walt Ray. He, he, we lost him out in the desert, and that's his crash site. But what I really wanted to show you was we went back to CIA headquarters in 79. That's when we put the plane. That's our plane to CIA headquarters. And the two stars represent the two pilots we lost. We did attend, okay, this is when we, lost, we met Michael Hayden on that trip. About that time, they were declassifying everything, and we were approached by journalists out of um, the New York, I mean, the LA Times. We'll do a story on the veterans, the very 51. We were being declassified and also, and we were going back to, we for, on a, t a 10 day trip back to Washington. And we, and we took some of our, our pilots, our engineers, uh, different ones, and we spent 10 days of doing nothing but going to different intelligence agencies and giving talks just like I gave you here. The CIA, uh, Dr. Robards was our moderator. We did two in the bubble. We took this writer along with us so that she could get her story. She met all the people. She met, we. Um, here's some of the people. Right? That's her on the uh, on the end, on the end over there. There we are with James Clapper, Leon Panetta. That's up on Capitol Hill. The other guy with the beard, uh, Dr. Robard, the chief historian. And that's we all wish I would hear my picture taken there. Anyway, we took her on the trip, spent 10 days with us, meeting all these people. These people right here, this is SR-71 pilots, historians, uh, two of them got PhDs. She got to interview all these people. She interviewed them here in Vegas. She now, she wrote a book. It was on the, the uh, New York bestseller for weeks. She's made millions on it. She's now the media's go-to person with something going on every fifth one, like the thing they're doing right now. The first place all the media went was to her, because she's the expert on every fifth one. But if you go back in time, why Area 51 really started, Here's our you learn that 
it was a base hidden inside of a base, nuclear weapons. And it was all about beating Stalin at his black propaganda campaign. This I write in the book. Mm. To hoax Americans in a war of the worlds type scenario whereby little men who looked like aliens would get out of an aircraft and the government would go crazy it's about it. Short. And then Stalin would say, look, we have, not only do we have technology better than you, but we have a better propaganda department than you. <laughs> Receiving that craft at Area 51 in 1951, which is why the base is called Area 51. Oh. And that inside the craft were humans who had been altered, surgically altered to look like aliens in a plan for Stalin to sort of twist Truman's arm. Because at that time, we had the atomic bomb. When Roswell happened, we had the atomic bomb, and the Soviets did not. These were, you know, modified human beings as part of a hoax. And the reason that I trust the source is because, like this, it was small, it had big eyes. It's, yes, those were the gen genetically, I mean, those were the surgically modified humans that the government was doing experiments on, I setting off nuclear bombs in Area 51, mm -hmm. mushroom, I mean, in this, She's what real. the Russians do, we do. Look, I've written so five books, him, we had a small now. program in 1951 where we wanted to see how the Russians did what they did, how they made human beings look like this. Said they were handicapped children. Mm -hmm. In those days, drones were, there was a mothership and a drone was attached to it and it was jettisoned off, okay? Mm -hmm. So, according to 1947, 48, 48, right? I mean, that was drone technology then, Okay. right? So there's a mother, a mother craft, like an aircraft, mm -hmm. and then the drone is like a small aircraft under it and it gets jettisoned off. And that was what the craft was. It was jettisoned off. So that so Stalin actually, in, according to the source, invaded our airspace, which was the deep embarrassment to Truman. So A2. And remember, I mean, not remember, but where where this was, was, you know, very close to a nuclear weapons base, to mm -hmm. our White Sands military base. I mean, mm -hmm. this is like not a place you want the Russians to be able to get near, right. you know. I mean, what was interesting is at Area 51, we then went out and mimicked all of those. One of our early drones was a mimicry of that. It was the D. There was a M21, which was the mothership, and a D21, which was the daughter ship. So, How did you know, then it was like the, there was a pilot in the mothership, and they kind of let it go, mm. right? And it flew off. I mean, there's incredible stories of what the CIA was able to do out there at Area 51 with their air branch, you know. Um, the technology, they're always ahead of technology. That's what's yeah. remarkable. Did this horrible program out there, and the government doesn't want anyone to know about that ever. I mean, there are stories of, like, somebody asking Bill Clinton, you know, about Area 51, him going white. I mean, human experiments? Who wants to be part of that? It's horrible. But goodness, I mean, you read now the declassified documents tell us how many different human experiments were going on around nuclear weapons. Okay, horrible experiments where they were subjecting people to radiation because they wanted to know, they felt, well, it's more important to know what happens to people than to not know. And so they would take groups of people that say had cancer or something and test them. So there's no doubt that the government has experimented on humans. Mm. It's just, is that something that is wise to make public? And, you know, there's two sides of the coin on that. I mean, you, you, when you reveal these kind of things, when you write about them, I mean, people get really upset and, you know, vilify the government, partially with good reason and partially it's like bad for national security. So I think that's the justification on the part of the de Defense Department to keep things secret. So during the time that you're refreshing yourself out there, there could be a lot of interesting conversations about experiments. <laughs> but again, thank you so much, T.D. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. We, are, we obviously do not send Christmas cards to that woman. <laughs> Please join us in the lobby. Thank you. Thank you. I sure do. Sure. Good job, T.D.